I was not expecting to enjoy this show and the music as much as I did. On top of that, I turned into a bit of a Twitter stan, which is something I have to rein in because their official Twitter is aware of me. At first I thought it was a fan account and then I realized, oh, this is the Twitter that's linked to their website. So now I have to chill out, but I'm also making this video, so... This is a really big problem. It's not just a problem, it's an idea emergency! Your video tipping yourself. Audio! Audio! But lovers, welcome back to the lore series where we take a look at shows no one else is brave enough to. And by shows no one else is brave enough to, I mean iconic, nostalgic children's media. But the way in which I talk about these shows is geared mostly towards adults. Huh, geared. That's... That's pretty funny. I get absurd, I look way too far into it, I curse a little. I actually do cuss a little. And I don't want any angry letters from parents, okay? You've been warned. Imagination Movers has been requested so much since I started this series, and for good reason. Even the origin of this band is wholesome. For the longest time, I just assumed the Imagination Movers was assembled and cast by Disney, but that's not the case. The Playhouse Disney show aired from 2008 to 2013, but the band has existed from 2002 to now. Smitty, Scott, Dave, and Rich assembled the band in New Orleans. According to Wikipedia, It's, it's my, my only source school taught me nothing. nothing. The group's goal is to encourage creativity, provide positive male role models, and make content that spoke to kids, not spoke down to them. Did they accomplish this goal? Yes! I'm gonna talk way more about it, but first let's jump into the three season and 75 episode series. I watched every single episode and took detailed notes. I'm a professional. As is common with most shows revolving around a band, they use their real names within the show. And they also wear these nifty name tags, which I love because I suck with names. I think everybody should do this. Once again, in theme song order, this is Smitty, who has a magical notebook that provides picture and video visuals. In season one, these visuals floated above their heads, but in season two and three, they were affixed to the page, probably to differentiate it from other visual powers that the other members possess. I'm getting ahead of myself. Scott has wobble goggles. The wobble goggles are a bit overpowered, I will say that. They can see through walls, see far away, make sound waves visible, show the component something is made out of, and we even saw it stripped down a cape. What? Now if you're new to this channel, I'm a little shit. Usually I'd say this tech is scary and play it up, but this is Scott we're talking about, okay? This group has cured me of my cynicism and I trust them more than most people. If anyone can handle this immense power, it's them. Okay, I'm sorry, where was I? Dave has a bottomless hat. He's also the inventor of the group, so he probably made everything I just mentioned. And Rich uses his scribble sticks to draw in the air or on surfaces. It's also the only invention to tie into the band element since they're obviously also drumsticks. The four best friends run the Idea Warehouse. Imagination Movers isn't only their band name, it's their company name. The company helps people solve their problems. That's why they're dressed like mechanics, but they're not just fixing machinery, they're fixing lives. In season one, they were actually struggling to get customers. Can you guys? Yeah. We don't have any customers. No, we don't. Yeah. So they were mostly solving their own problems or their friends' problems. One of their best friends is Nina. The first episode even revolved around them giving her a 100-day friendiversary gift in the form of a song. Literally, how nice is that? Where are the nice people at? Who do I have to put friend around here to get a song? Another good friend of theirs is Warehouse Mouse. The first few episodes I saw this guy, I was really convinced I wasn't gonna like him. I thought he caused too much trouble. I thought his voice would annoy me. Mommy, mommy, fun half me. <laughs> and I thought he only helped out his friends when he was bribed with pocket cheese. He kind of has a Pikachu sidekick vibe in that he is actually a little shit, but it's well balanced with all of the times he's also a really good friend. One doesn't override the other. He's just an agent of chaos. How can I hate on that? And his friendship with Smitty is adorable. We will talk about Knit Knots in a bit. He's iconic. He gets his own section. Okay, so the beginning of every episode establishes the problem. And then they sing one of my favorite songs songs brainstorming. They sing this song every single episode and I did not skip it once. Every time they do their brainstorming, a literal storm forms around them from the sheer power of their minds. Oh my God. We know this isn't just in their imaginations because other characters constantly question it. Hey, all that winds? The thunderclouds? The literal tornado? 
Yeah, yeah, what was that? The power of the imagination movers keep up, get into it, we've barely scratched the surface. The episode shows them going through many ideas before reaching a solution. One of the many strategies they use is going into the different rooms of the warehouse for help. Where are we? The warehouse has many rooms. Here are all the ones mentioned. Get ready for a big old list with tangents along the way. Here we go. They have the noisy room, maze room, cold room, sun room. Then in the episode Too Cool, we see this map. They too are amazing by the sheer amount of rooms they have. Their warehouse might just be as big as a Costco. Some icons I see on the map are bubbles, a seahorse, and what appears to be two noisy rooms? They then go through their own list of rooms, but a transition screen cuts off all the ones at the start, and the only ones we hear after the transition screen are zigzag room, the zipper room, and the zucchini room. In the episode Puppy Problem, we hear about the bouncing toy room, flying toy room, rolling toy room, and squeaky toy room. All of them next to each other, so this implies there might be some order in the way that they're arranged. The lost and found room, everything lost in the warehouse appears there. The wheel room, wind room, magnet room, drum room. During the episode The Unparty, we see the opposite room. You wore your shoes on your hands for a week. <laughs> The opposite room is very confusing. This room messes with their minds and their perception of reality. I simply would never go in there. It should have padded walls. Dancing room, not too scary room, clock room, paint room, scale room, sports room, outside room, very vague. Why not just go outside at that point? Indoors, indoors, indoors. Jungle room, which they explored for the first time with an Indiana Jones parody. Gift room, relaxation room, bubble garden, big sky room, which really does stand out in comparison to the other rooms because it doesn't look like a room at all. Forest room, baby toy room, farm room, cattle roping room. Yes, they have livestock in many of these rooms, actually. I think the rooms produce the resources needed to take care of them. Squeaky clean room, stuffed animal room, bike room, barbershop room, fairy tale room, meta room, big silly room with all kinds of funny stuff in it. Spring room, summer room, fall room, sunshine room, garden room, pirate room, arts and crafts room, Irish clover room, rock climbing room, hot dog room, lights room, robot room, golf waterfall room, baseball room, flower room, coffee table room, surfs up room, music room, movie room, cheese room, castle room, sail the I seas room. Get it! Tiny break, this room doesn't sound like a real word anymore. In the episode Power Play, we discover that the warehouse runs on electricity instead of pure magic, apparently. So they have to conserve energy and turn off many things in these thousands of rooms. But then they decide to utilize the power of the outdoor rooms. Solar power in the sun room, hydropower in the waterfall room, and wind power in the wind room. So now they have infinite power. Back to listing the rooms, we're almost done. I lied. Cookie coconut room, going bananas room, perfect pineapple room, fresh flowers room, shiny seashells room. The adjectives in these room names intrigue me. With the existence of the perfect pineapple room, is there an imperfect pineapple room? And same with shiny seashells. Is there a unshiny seashells, dull seashells even? The tropical island room is, as the name implies, a body of land with water on all sides. So they actually enter into the water. This room has its own ocean. And in this room, in the episode Castaways, Scott accidentally used their boat's rope, so now they are stranded. These rooms are so large and deal with the elements so much that it is possible to get stuck in them. It is possible to get lost in them. Even more confusing than that, in the episode Snore Mori, they explain that they are planning new rooms for the warehouse, so they took out books to do research. They create the rooms? Uh? With every new room, do they expand or do they just change an existing room? For example, we heard about the farm room, but in the episode Scott and the Magic Beanstalk, there's a fancy farm room. Is that a totally different room or did they make the old farm room just a little bougie? I'm asking the questions that matter. This is really important stuff. The Hall of Fame is a museum dedicated to all of their achievements and all of their best ideas solved. Love the self-love, more on that Hall of Fame in a second. The last room we will discuss is the moon room. You take the moon, now you take the moon, now you take the moon. In the episode Uffle Fluffs, Smitty bought space rocks, which makes me think that these guys casually have billions of dollars. That's some Metalocalypse type shit. Yeah, I just bought NASA. I was bored. Next thing you know, they have an alien now. They accidentally let an alien into the NASA PR package. At first they were excited to have a cute alien pet and were planning on taking care of it, but then it started multiplying very quickly after having pizza. One to two to eight to 12. They even got to the pizza supply in Dave's hat. Were they born in his hat? Like did they instantly spawn next to the pizza? Or did they somehow sneak into his hat while we all weren't looking? They take them to the moon room and that's where this, at this point, Colin of aliens will live for the rest of their lives. I was holding off saying this, but holy shit, this is Odd Squad. 
This is legitimately Odd Squad. I also can't even think about the implications of them having this alien colony because their outfits go so hard. I want these Power Rangers looking spacesuits so bad. And on top of that, in their song they sing, they casually quote the Beastie Boys. It's a galactic planetary outside. I keep thinking they can't get cooler and they always do. Also, I feel a bit silly making the Beastie Boys connection now because straight up on their Wikipedia, it lists them as one of their inspirations. Having a whole series of me analyzing subtext is very fun and silly when sometimes just straight up text text goes over my head. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. In the series finale, Save the Warehouse, we meet the Diane. You may call me the Diana. A city planner who thinks a parking lot would benefit the community more than the idea warehouse. This is alarming for multiple reasons. One, you're telling me there's no parking lot room? And two, if you leveled the warehouse, what would happen to all the living creatures that live there? Including the aliens in the moon room. Oh my god. The movers take the Diana to the Hall of Fame where they show off just how useful they are to the community. But apparently she's beyond hype about this freaking parking lot, so she makes up her mind to shut the warehouse down. The guys packed up the entire warehouse in Dave's hat. The only place we can fit all our stuff? <laughs> We don't have time to unpack all of that. Luckily, they do get to unpack after she sees just how much everyone needs them. Why the change of heart? Did the community rally behind them? You know, teamwork makes the dream work in order to make change? No. They just needed to solve one of her problems in order for her to completely 180 on that decision. Fire this city planner effective immediately. She's making all of her decisions based on what only benefits her. She's an icon. She's a legend, and she is the moment. Now come on now. Knit Knots is Nina's uncle. His one personality trait is that he's boring. It's his business model, it's what he enjoys, it's how he lives his life. It sounds one dimensional, but it's how this character is used in the series that intrigues me. Because you'd think with all these over the top personalities, they'd butt heads, but that's not the case. In the very first episode, No Noise is Good Noise, we hear how Nina is working for her uncle, who is currently trying to figure out a way to make music boring. In the episode Body Language, the movers get their first customer and they have to figure out how to help them even though they don't speak the same language. Turns out the visitor is Knitnot's cousin Drabdull from Bordovia. And Drabdull says Bordovia is very boring and Drabdull doesn't like boring. I need to know more about this family. How much of this love of boredom is cultural and how much of it is just nature? In the episode Bucket of Trouble, Knitnot's is selling breakfast bits a boring breakfast cereal that comes in three flavors. Regular, plain, and extra bland. I almost want to make a video called trying to live like knit knots for a week because my maximalist ass could not. Slapping a mannequin's ass is far too <sighs> exciting. Yeah, I can't do it anymore! <laughs> I busted my ass for that bit. I don't know where the hanger went. <laughs> I didn't mean for it to spin. End of that bit, back to the breakfast bits. Knit Knot says he has so many breakfast bits orders. There is in fact a demographic for this. At this point, I'd even say his business is doing better than the movers. At first, the Imagination Movers have no idea how to interact with Knit Knots. In the episode Unparty, I pondered if Nina was like trying to prank her uncle or something because she knows he wants nothing exciting or party-like for his birthday. So she invites these four guys that specialize in over-the-top party-like activities into her uncle's office. Also, right at the start, he says no songs and they immediately sing a song at him. I mean, at the end, they did make him a boring-themed non-party and he loved it. So it's clear that even though they struggled, they are actually trying to make him happy. In season one, episode 15, Wayne Dance, Knit Knots barged into the idea warehouse and said they were being too loud for Rocky, his pet rock, to sleep. He says he usually sleeps like a rock. Okay, so what does this mean? Is Knit Knots imagining? Is he playing pretend with his rock? Because that sounds far too exciting for him. Or is his rock actually alive? The winner is Rocky! <laughs> The next episode, entitled Hiccups, Knit Knots gets an extreme case of the hiccups, and it's a lot. <coughs> this dude is fully gasping for air unintentionally, and they're like, huh, that's a funny noise. Kind of reminds us of our song about funny noises. Silly little sounds like honk and squeak and I can't breathe. Or silly little sounds. I'm not sure a song will help, even though it is a bop. 
In the episode Present Problem, the movers gave Knitknots a holiday present of a bell that can't ring. And he's absolutely giddy about it. I love that they made Knitknots a foil to the movers as opposed to an enemy or a foe. Although some Imagination Movers shenanigans might be rubbing off on him. Because in the Mother's Day episode, he was singing and dancing? Hold on to that. And in the season one finale, Rockabye Rich, Knitknots makes an odorless perfume. This has got to be the most useless, boring product yet. Because flavorless food can still give you energy. Boring music can put you to sleep. What in the fuck is this supposed to do? Hey girl, I got you some perfume. Oh wow, thanks. Is this just water? Girl, you smell perfect. Just the way you are. But take a fucking shower. Now here's where I deliver the bad news. Knit knots never comes back. He was only a character in season one, and I have no idea why he never showed up again. I was trying to see if they explained this, and I found a comment on a forum that said, I think the actor just got bored of playing him, which is very funny. I mean, one of the last times we saw him, he was singing and dancing. So after he realized what he'd done, he probably just vowed to never go back there again. Maybe he was so repulsed he even moved his office to. It's just so funny because Nina's still here, and her whole reason for visiting so much in season one is because she worked with her uncle, whose office was so close by. And now he's nowhere to be seen. Season two and three focused way more on the customers. They went from having no customers to exclusively having celebrities and mythical creatures come into their office for help. Ace Mulligan, a famous golfer in their world. Pants Armstrong, a famous biker who almost quit biking after riding into a clothesline. Dude, your name's Pants Armstrong, not Pants Armstrong. Get your shit together. Stanley Spielberger, a famous director. The Santa Claus, a new tooth fairy, and whatever the hell this thing is. Looks like he belongs on Yo Gabba Gabba. Also a great video. In the season two episode, Nina Gets the Giggles, Nina needs to get rid of her giggles before her harp recital. So the mover suggests she starts acting like someone serious. Hmm, who's someone serious they know? They don't even mention Knit Knots. Oh. They didn't just write him off. They erased Knit Knots from the narrative. Like some kind of knot, a dumb untied knot, they unknit their knot. Speaking of Nina, throughout these seasons, she also has a career journey, since obviously she's not working for her uncle anymore, since he doesn't exist. So in season two, she's a photographer for the newspaper. Then in the season three episode, Idea Cafe, we get a little bit more backstory. The movers love Bernie's Cafe, which is right next door. Prior to this, we've never even seen a location other than the warehouse. This is so neat. Let's see this cafe everyone's been hyping up. The cafe is shutting down and Bernie is retiring. The one time we joined them for breakfast and this is our luck, this is how they came Came up with the idea that Nina should run a new cafe. She also loved the idea, exclaiming that this would be a great way to show off her photography. So they didn't just disregard that like they did with her first job. It's fine. It's fine. Imagination movers, you gotta sing about it. In the episode Bad Hair Day, we learned that Scott has some sort of curse where he has incurably bad hair on days where an important picture is being taken of him. And the episode ends with the rest of the group making their hair look silly for the picture, so he feels okay with his being silly. So the curse continues, I guess. I'm surprised they didn't just hold his hair down for the picture. They didn't even try that. Also, Smitty's hair doesn't even look bad. He's kind of rocking that look. I'm a sucker for songs about inner beauty, though, so I'll let it slide. Who cares what you look like anyway? You Don't Know You're Beautiful by One Direction? Flop. Cover Girl by Big Time Rush? Flop! Imagination movers outsold. Sweaty. In the episode Bucket of Trouble, we see that the real villain of the show is their voicemail. Multiple times she was kind of poking fun at them, and it seemed like they were in on the joke until this episode. It's clear that she's constantly trying to plant seeds of doubt. She hates their business model and thinks they'll never succeed. She got real quiet after season two, I'll tell you that. Talking a lot of shit for a bitch with no lips. You have no new messages. If you would like to give them now, please press one. Hey, we'll never give up. First of all, rude. This was the first thing we've ever seen that got under their skin. Second of all, what would have happened if they pressed one? Would she have dropped the snarky act and started to pep talk them? Or is this some kind of rogue AI situation? Baby's first HAL 9000. The season two episode It's a Mystery had the song I Need It Anyway. This song is about healthy foods that lists their benefits, but it still doesn't come across as teachy preachy because Dave was like, that's just an added bonus. I'd eat it anyway. This is a more convenient
convincing way to try and get kids to have healthy foods. Because when you just list how good it is for the body, but say nothing about enjoyment, you start to get the feeling this is gonna taste like shit, right? This is gonna be like medicine, right? This whole show has such a fun approach. Reach high, think big, work hard, have fun is such a good breakdown of what they do. Because this show isn't even always promoting logic or a clear step-by-step -step of how to do things like Special Agent Oso. The true power lies in the fact that they don't give up, encouraging a can-do spirit with creativity. They completely accomplish their goal of talking to kids and not down to them. Because they're focusing on entertainment as opposed to do this, do this, do this. In the episode Happy Ha Ha Holidays, the movers help Santa get his jolly laugh back because it sounds weirdly sinister now for some reason. <laughs> Ew. And Christmas obviously can't go on like this. Kids are gonna get nightmares hearing <laughs> coming down their chimney. Ah, but ho ho ho, you can break and enter into my house anytime. Although I personally believe Santa's beard should be a bit longer, I like this casting way more than Team Umi Zoomies. I hated that shit. By the way, next month I will be ranking different TV and movie Santas, so prepare yourselves. In the episode Farmhouse Mouse, Warehouse Mouse's cousin Farmhouse Mouse comes to visit. Common domesticated mouse culture is apparently changing your name to where you live, but more importantly than that, this episode's song, Seven Days a Week, is about learning the seven days of the week. And it's a total jam, chart-topping stuff, no surprises there, but this song starts off so innocent, so unassuming, spreading the message of, wow, we have so much fun on all these these days. And then the last line of the song hits us with, One of these days I'll know everything. Honestly, even if my life depended on it, I never could have predicted that's how this song ends. The line itself is so ominous. If any other dude sang one of these days I'll know everything, I'd be screaming, I'd be crying. That's a lot of stuff to know and I don't trust you. But Dave, He's so chill, look at this guy. This guy could hold the secrets to the universe and I'd feel safe knowing that. Have I mentioned that this group has completely replaced Big Time Rush as my favorite band of goofballs? Goodbye, James Maslow. I barely knew you. One of these days they'll know everything. Season two, episode 13, a new tooth fairy needs help with, what did she say? Sneaking into kids' rooms. Uh-oh. You know what's more weird than that? The side plot of the Tooth Fairy wanting to get with Rich. She's not subtle. The episode ends with Scott getting hype as fuck over a quarter. I'm so excited! <laughs> because you helped the Tooth Fairy? No, because I got a quarter. Oh, oh, and helping the Tooth Fairy was neat too. Yeah. And I got a quarter! <laughs> we all need more of Scott's enthusiasm. I might be a little late getting to the warehouse this morning. See you soon. Oh, that customer sounds just like Smitty. Unless, that is Smitty? Hey guys, did you get my message? I knew it was me! I knew it was right! He made me laugh so much throughout the series. I didn't think this show would even make me giggle or chuckle. They made me full body laugh multiple times. In the season two episode, Out of Tune, a musician has lost the ability to write new songs. And the solution was to try new experiences and live your life so you can have more inspiration. Imagination mover, solve creator burnout, not clickbait. I have creative friends, I have creative family, and I always tell them you can't pour from an empty bucket. The whole you have to be a tortured artist to make good art is a lie. Ah, why am I enjoying this show so much? In the season three episode, Fathers Know Best, we meet the movers' dads who are played by them. First of all, they killed it with the different voices. You really are just like your sons, except- <laughs> And also each of their personalities are so distinct and exaggerated. We really see how each of their parenting styles play a part in who their sons became. Smitty's dad with his nature notebook. Dave's dad being a professor and having a fanny pack that works very similarly to his hat. Rich's dad being a coach. And Scott's dad putting on puppet shows just like his son. Now put your mother freaking hands together for the insecurity arc. Now that we've answered the question, who are the imagination movers? Let's ask, how are the imagination movers? In Slam Dunk Solution, Smitty is feeling insecure about playing basketball with his friends, so he makes up excuses as to why he can't. When really, he's just embarrassed that his friends are better than him. We also see that the friendship between him and Warehouse Mouse is more than just one-sided nurturing. Warehouse Mouse is the first one to notice that Smitty is not being honest about how he feels. <sighs> You're right. I'm not that busy. And the episode, of course, ends with his friends reassuring him and encouraging him. In the episode one cool mover, Scott feels uncool. And after he meets biker Jerry Russo, I mean, Clutch, he just copies him because he wants to be cool. 
But you're already cool, Scott! And then, in a war to the wise, Dave has his whole insecurity journey because he doesn't have a trophy. Although he helped all of his friends earn theirs. And, um... Rich doesn't have any insecurities, actually. Dave made an invention to, in his words, switch things. Very vague. What does that mean? Rich and Scott seem to think that he switched the sounds a cat and dog make. Oh, a dog speaking cat and a cat speaking dog, right? No. Dave says to the cat, Welcome back, kitty. <laughs> Welcome back, kitty. Dave, that's a little scary! Welcome back to your body feline experiment. Uh, Dave, what did you say? My plan is finally coming to fruition. Soon I will possess Scott's luscious locks! Would you believe me if I told you it was more out of left field than that? Rich and warehouse mouse, of all people, or of all rodents, switch bodies. And the invention breaks for a second, so they're stuck like that. I don't know which is more cursed. Actually, Warehouse Mouse and Rich's body for sure. I would be mortified if I were Rich. And unsurprisingly, he is... Dave! Sorry, I think the switcheroo is broken. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. When you're not really fine. You I also have to show you Scott's disgust. I don't think running out of cheese is really an idea emergency. It isn't? Oh, yeah, I gotta help Dave. The shutter! I'm screaming! Ugh, I have to help Dave. He's so grossed out, it's so great. Scott noticed Rich struggling and quickly obtained a mini mover suit for him. My sister was watching with me and was like, oh, is that from when they were kids? Yeah, Kelly, it's from when they were two inches tall. Once the episode ends, we still see Dave's slightly sketchy use of this invention. <laughs> Let's go find that cow. Don't let PETA see this episode. Where are they now? Like I said in the beginning, they're still performing. They're on tour. I fell down a TikTok rabbit hole of watching like imagination movers. Dave's daughter posts TikToks of them. It's really adorable and wholesome. They are all family men and everyone only has positive things to say about them. Raise your hand if you're surprised. Exactly. Scott is a professor and program coordinator of music business. They're all so cool. Writing the script was a bit stressful, I'm not gonna lie, because I just respect them all so much. You already know what's coming. I'm gonna trauma fart about my daddy oh, issues. It, I mean, how could I not? As someone whose upbringing was lacking a compassionate male figure, this show means a lot to me, even as an adult. I really enjoyed watching it. Thank you so much to the Imagination Movers and to my fiance because I was annoying as fuck throughout this process. I hope you guys enjoyed. This was so much fun. If you enjoyed and you're not subscribed, maybe consider subscribing. I also have a second channel where I post more vlogs. I post mail times with my P.O. box. I posted a vlog from when I was at Comic-Con cosplaying as two brains. Check it out. I have so many videos. The Halloween ones are still being slept on. I'm fine with that. I'm really cool with it. Thank you so much to all my YouTube members and thank you so much for watching. Bye!